summary, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cover two things um, that have fallen out of the Schrems 2 case. First of all, the new guidance on using standard contractual clauses. And then secondly, I'll look at the new draft clauses themselves that have just recently been published. So first of all, let's look at the guidance, the um, European Data Protection Board guidance that was published on the 11th of November. Uh, the, the, the board, the EDPB, is made up of the heads of all of the um, data protection authorities uh, around Europe. And they, they've published this guidance and they've invited comments by actually the 30th of November. I suspect that date will be pushed back because there's already uh, an awful lot of um, uh, uh, criticism and discussion about it, which will need to be dealt with uh, in a very thorough manner, I suspect. The significance of the guidance, just so you understand, is that um, if you are using the standard contractual clauses as a lawful basis for transferring data from uh, Europe to overseas, then you must follow that guidance in order to adhere to the court's ruling in TREMS 2. So in order to be able to lawfully use the, the, those clauses properly. Uh, and what the guidance does is it, it sets out a two step process for using standard contractual clauses. And, and, and to be clear, I am massively simplifying here. Um, the first step is for the exporter who's, who's exporting the data to carry out a transfer assessment by analysing the destination of the exported data. Now, we should all be reasonably familiar with the notion of, of carrying out due diligence on the importer of, of data overseas. Um, but what this is, is looking actually at the uh, location of that importer. Um, not that the requirements to carry out due diligence on the importer have, have in any way diminished. Now, just as an aside, obviously, if the uh, location of the importer uh, is a country in respect of which an adequacy decision has been issued by the Commission already, then we don't need to worry about any of this. We don't need to use the um, standard contractual clauses. So countries like New Zealand, Canada, Jersey, Guernsey, that, that position has not changed at all. But for all other countries, including uh, the USA, most notably, um, all of this guidance is going to be uh, very, very relevant indeed. So. Um, the first part, the first step, as I say, this transfer assessment requires um, exporters to satisfy themselves that um, when they use these standard contractual clauses, those clauses will actually be effective. And that will depend on the laws and practices of the importer's country. Um, uh, and you know, what, what does that really mean in practice? Well, essentially, um, the uh, EDPB have acknowledged that the um, standard contractual clauses impose duties on importers to hold data securely, but that that is of limited practical value if in reality third parties are permitted to access the data overseas, often without the importer's knowledge. And, and the best example of this would be uh, the entitlements of the National Security Agency in the States to, to, to access data in certain circumstances and all the, the stuff that we learned from the Edward Snowden revelations several years ago. So how do you make this assessment of the country, of the importer's um, laws and practices? Well, first of all, the importer is required to assist with that exercise. But then the guidance says that first and foremost, the assessment must be based on publicly available legislation. Um, and, and the key focus is on whether there are effective local data protection laws and there's effective redress available to individuals in that country. And to assist with this assessment, the EDP um, simultaneously published another uh, piece of guidance, which um, uh, gives you uh, um, a, a four, four issues to consider um, when looking at whether there are what they call essential guarantees in that overseas jurisdiction for, for giving protection to data protection um, to, to, to individuals. Um, the, that document is not exactly user friendly and it doesn't give you a definitive approach, but it is at least something to think about when carrying out the assessment. Once you've done your assessment, you've got to document your findings either way. So yet more GDPR paperwork, I'm afraid. If you conclude that the laws and practices in the importer's country are effective, you can then enter into your model clauses and export the data. If you think the laws and practices are not effective, then um, you have to move on to step two in the guidance. And step two is uh, a, a suggestion of introducing some sort of supplementary measures in the relationship between the exporter and the importer. And there are three types of measures that you can implement according to the guidance, uh, technical measures, contractual measures, 
and organisational measures. So we'll look at the technical measures first. These are probably the most important part of the guidance. And these are aimed at the steps you could take to, 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 to try and prevent access to the data overseas altogether, or at least access to anything that's identifiable. So the guidance talks about using state-of-the-art encryption, where the key is held by the exporter back in Europe, uh, pseudonymization, and possibly splitting the data that you export between multiple processes in different jurisdictions. But the guidance then goes on to acknowledge that in many instances, and in two particular situations, those sorts of measures are of absolutely no use to anybody. Um, the first one is where the exporter in Europe is sending data overseas to a cloud provider or some sort of processor which, which needs access to the data because access to the data is inherent to the service being provided. The second situation is where you're transferring data for some sort of shared business purpose, probably on a, an intra-group basis, maybe a, 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 an HR database, something like that, where the recipient of the data, again, needs to access the data in a usable format. Um, so it may well be that you conclude that, that these technical measures are of no use to you whatsoever, in which case we need to look at the other types of measures, the first of which is contractual. And this is um, looking to build on, on the measures that, and the, the obligations that sit between the exporter and the importer, and they primarily focus on the sort of transparency that's given by the importer to, to, to the exporter, perhaps confirming that there are no technical backdoors in its IT systems that enable third party access, and um, possibly offering enhanced audit rights, that sort of thing. And then finally, organizational measures. Um, these will include things like internal, it's kind of beefed up internal policies that apply to the importer, a bit like binding corporate rules. Um, and document processes for data minimization and, and uh, notification where, where a public authority requests access to data. Now, the challenge with the contractual measures and the organizational measures is that, um, according to the sort of separate guidance they've given for those, um, it's, it's very, very difficult to implement them in a meaningful way if you've already concluded that the country in question, uh, the laws and practices of the country in question aren't effective for enforcing the standard contractual clauses. So it's a bit of a bit of a farce, really. You, you, you fail on step one, the effectiveness test, you move to step two, you implement your measures, but your measures won't, won't work because the country uh, isn't, uh, isn't providing effective um, data protection um, for individuals. So um, in many instances, it looks like the export is going to be left with two choices, either don't export data from Europe or implement the supplementary measures and just hope for the best. Music